Well, it's good to be with you tonight. Please take your Bible and find, if you would, the Gospel of Luke and chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. I want to talk to you uh, this evening uh, about prayer. Um, the title would be Called to Prayer. We as believers are called to pray. And I want us to think that through a little bit this evening. There is one verse that I want to share with you from Luke 18 and verse 1. And I'll read it this evening. And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. You know, I have often thought and stated that nothing in Christianity is talked about more and practice less than prayer. We make prayer lists, we gather for prayer meetings, we sing songs about prayer, we hear sermons and lessons about prayer, but at the end of the day, I'm not quite sure how much prayer, uh, effectual fervent prayer, uh, really exists within uh, uh, the life of a believer. So I want us to focus on that. And yet when you think about it, uh, prayer is the one thing that we really need to do. Uh, you know, we can talk about different disciplines in the Christian life, but, but prayer is absolutely essential uh, to our relationship with God, to our effectiveness as a servant. And, and so I want us to think about that tonight. Now, hold your place here in Luke 18, 1, and just go back a few chapters, if you would, uh, to the 11th chapter. Luke chapter uh, 11, if you would, and we're going to look at verse 1, and there's an interesting observation uh, from this verse that I want to share with you. Luke 11 and verse 1, it says, And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, that's Jesus praying, when he, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. You see, the disciples understood the necessity of prayer. And, and so they, they asked him, Lord, teach us to do this. We, we've watched your life. We see you praying. We've heard you praying. But, but Lord, we want to learn. Help us. Teach us to pray. Now, I find that fascinating because when you study Scripture, you'll not find the disciples saying, Lord, teach us to preach. We know the importance of preaching, but they don't ask him that. They don't ask him, Lord, teach us to heal. They don't ask, us, ask him, Lord, teach us to teach or even teach us to worship. Uh, they said, teach us to pray. You see, it was the prayer life of Jesus Christ that absolutely captivated his disciples. And might I say, it's the prayer life of Jesus Christ that ought to captivate us today. We too should be learning from him about this thing called prayer. You know, Martin Luther said, as it is, as it is the, the business, business of the tailor uh, to make clothes and the business of the cobbler to make shoes, it is the business of the Christian to pray. It's, it's, it's our responsibility uh, to pray. Now, I want you to go back, if you would, uh, to Luke 18. And I want you to look one more time at this verse. Luke 18 and verse 1. And I want to share with you three, really three words uh, from this, this verse and kind of uh, expound upon those words for just a moment. Let me read it again. And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Uh, there's no substitute for prayer. Absolutely no substitute. No amount of personality, no amount of knowledge, no amount of money, no amount of giftedness um, <clears throat> can be a substitute for prayer. Uh, prayer is essential. Let me give you three reasons why we must pray, why we're called to prayer. First of all, because prayer is a sacred duty, a sacred duty. Now, here's the word I want you to see, the word ought. He said, he spake a parable unto them to this end that men ought to pray, ought. That word ought, that is a, that is a word used to express duty or obligation. Uh, on one hand, prayer is a divine privilege. We understand that. The fact that we can communicate with God um, any day, every day, often through the day, that's, a, that's an enormous privilege that we have. But yet, at the same time, it's a sacred duty. We ought to do it. In fact, uh, as you study Scripture, uh, you'll find there are certain things that, that the Bible teaches that we ought to do as believers. These are not optional things. These are not suggestions. These are not recommendations. I mean, these are things that, that God expects us to do. They're sacred duties, if you will. Prayer certainly is one. I, I think of Acts chapter 5 and verse 29. And in that passage, the Bible says that we ought to obey God rather than man. And uh, we understand that. In a choice between what man says and God says, we, we, we ought to obey God. That, that's an obligation. Or I think of Romans 15 and verse 1 
where the Bible says that we ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. Uh, that is, those of us who are spiritually strong and physically strong, uh, emotionally strong, ought to be helping those who are struggling in life. We ought to do that. Again, not a suggestion, it's a, it's a responsibility that we possess. Or I think of 1 John 4 and verse 11. Uh, the Bible says that we ought to love one another. Wow, that really needs to uh, be heralded out in churches today. Uh, I, I've preached in, I don't know, five, 600 uh, Baptist churches, and, and, and I go into some and I can just see tension sometimes, and these people are not talking to these people, and this family's upset with this family, and this group's upset with the preacher, and uh, just, you know, that's just not the way God wants it to be. The Bible says that we ought to love one another. And, and, and that's, a, that's a, a, a responsibility, a sacred duty that we have. But prayer is a sacred duty. We ought to pray. Now think about it. Prayer can save us all. Prayer uh, can produce revival. Prayer can change a life. Prayer can heal a body. Prayer can solve a problem. Prayer can unify uh, a divided church. Prayer Prayer. You know, our, our country tonight uh, is in turmoil. As, as we look around and see what's happening in our nation, and oh my gracious, there's, there's so many things going on, and, and we're tempted to say, what's the answer? What's the solution? Well, it's certainly not, it's certainly not the, the White House, and it's certainly not politicians. I would suggest the answer is the church house and God's people. And the one thing we can do the one thing we can do, now there may be other things we can do, but the one thing we can do, in fact, the one thing we must do is pray. So think about it. We are to pray, let me give you three quick reasons. First of all, because of the expectation of the Father. The expectation of the Father. Jeremiah 33, verse 3. God said, call unto me and I will answer thee, show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. God expects us to talk with him. He expects that. You know, I have children. I have grandchildren. And I expect my children and grandchildren to talk with me. It's just, it's just natural. So why would, we, why would we be his children and not communicate with him, not pour our heart out to him, not talk with him? My gracious, it's just contrary to even logical thinking, let alone spiritual thinking. Prayer is an expectation. God expects us to do that. But not only the expectation of God the Father, we see the example of God the Son. I'll not take you to John uh, 17, but in John 17, beginning in verse 1, there are, there's a 26-word prayer that Jesus prayed. Oh, my gracious, it's a beautiful prayer, wonderful prayer. And as you go through that prayer, you see the heart of God the Son. You see uh, His burden for, for us even. And, 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 and that, that example should motivate us. Here's the thing. If Jesus Christ needed to pray, and He did, we need to pray even more so. So the expectation of the Father, the example of God the Son, but then thirdly, uh, the encouragement of the Holy Spirit. I love Romans chapter 8 and uh, verse 28. And I'm going to just uh, turn there very quickly. If you want to follow with me, you can. We'll come back here to uh, Luke uh, in just a moment. But when you turn to Romans chapter 8 and you begin to see this, this, um, this blessing that we have in prayer through the Holy Spirit, this, this encouragement that we receive. You see, there are times in life, and you know this to be true, certainly in your life and in my life and most all of us, there are times that the burden is so great, the challenge is so heavy, uh, the, 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 our hearts are breaking, and, and we, really, we really don't even know how to pray. We don't even know how to word the prayer. We don't even know what to say. We don't know how to communicate the deepest thoughts that we have and the pain that we have and the concern that we have. It may be over a lost loved one. It may be over a sick child. It may be over our nation, as I mentioned a moment ago. It may be over you know, distress in the life of other people that we love and we care for. And, and, and so we struggle to get that out. Well, Romans 8 and 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmity. You see, the infirmity is this. We know not what we should pray for as we ought. But thank God the Bible says, but the, but the Spirit itself make an intercession for us which, with groanings which cannot be uttered. In other words, the Holy Spirit has the ability and, 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 and the desire to take those burdens that we have buried in our heart, that are hard for us to grasp, hard for us to voice, hard for us to communicate, and, and, and those deepest fears and those, those heartaches and, and, and those concerns, and, and He somehow brings those to God the Father. Oh, what an encouragement that is. So I submit to you, first of all, as you look at Luke 18, verse 1, prayer is a sacred duty. We ought to do it. But now as we look at Luke 18, verse 1, there's another word that I want you to focus on. Not just the word ought, 
But then notice this word. And he spake a parable unto them to this end. That meant ought always to pray. The second word that I want us to consider very briefly tonight is that word always. Always. We ought to always pray. Now, I think there are three simple applications of that word as it relates to prayer. First of all, uh, uh, always refers to time. Do you realize any time of the day is a good time to pray? It, it doesn't just have to be morning or evening. In, in fact, you know, some people, they have their prayer time in the morning and other people at night and other people maybe in the afternoon. And some of it has to do with work schedules and family schedules. And, and they kind of set aside, this is the time. But do you realize when you study scripture, you find that people prayed at all times? Uh, Jesus certainly prayed in the morning. We have record of that. Uh, David prayed at noon. Peter and John prayed in the afternoon. David prayed in the evening. Paul and Silas at midnight. I mean, any time of the day is a good time to pray. And so when you're, you know, when you're um, get up in the morning, man, that's great. Have a prayer time. Maybe in the evening, maybe in the, in the afternoon. It doesn't matter. Praying always refers to time. But, but beyond that, I think it refers secondly to location. It doesn't matter where you are. You can pray in your automobile. Uh, as, as you think about how certain people drive, you probably do need to pray in your automobile. Um, you can pray at church. You can pray at uh, work. I mean, wherever you are, it, it, it doesn't have to just be somewhere, somewhere special to pray. Every place you commune with God is a special place. Every time you get alone with the Lord, again, whether it be in your automobile, whether, you know, wherever, that is a, that is a sacred spot for you to uh, pour your soul out to God and, and share the burdens of life and, and, and request His help and His wisdom. It refers to location. But then I believe it not only refers to, to time and, and location, I think when God says we ought always to pray, I think it refers to circumstance. You know, you think about life. Many times when, when we're in the valley, when, when the problems roll, when, when the struggles come, we know that's a good time to pray. we got to get a hold of God. We need His help. And by, by the way, that is a good time to pray. Um, he wants us to pray when we're hurting. He wants us to pray when we're confused. He wants us to pray when we're overwhelmed. But guess what? We ought not to just pray when, uh, when we're in distress. We ought to pray not just when we're in the valley. We ought to pray when we're on the mountaintop, when things are going well, when, you know, everybody's healthy and everybody's happy and we have a good job and God is blessing our heart and blessing our family. Hey, that's a great time to pray. Now, the words that we use, the, the sentiment, uh, the heart cry is different perhaps. When we're in the valley and, and, and we have problems, we're crying out to God for, you know, help and power and deliverance and wisdom. And when we're on the mountaintop and everything is good, we're thanking him and we're praising him and we're exalting him and worshiping him because he has blessed our life so richly. We're not in distress at that particular moment, but it, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, just, just have this mindset that men ought always to pray, regardless. You know, when you journey through the life of Jesus Christ, and wow, what a fascinating study his life is, and you start in the Gospels, and, and you just you find example after example. When Jesus prayed about different situations in different places at different times, he prayed for direction, he prayed because he was depleted in ministry and worn out and, and physically tired. He prayed before he made decisions when he chose the uh, out, of, out of this massive group of followers or disciples to uh, select apostles. There's just so many illustrations of how Jesus Christ prayed. And by the way, the scripture says we're to walk even as he walked. We're to be conformed to his image. Uh, we're to abide in him. And so if Jesus prayed, we need to pray. We have to pray. As I said, it's a sacred duty, uh, but, but, but it's an always, always uh, situation no matter where we are, no matter what time of the day, no matter what the circumstance. You know, if there's anything that an average local church needs, it's prayer. I'm convinced of that. More than we need uh, a larger membership, more than we need newer buildings, more than we need greater offerings, more than we need any of that, it's effectual, fervent prayer. There are so many churches in our country and literally around the world that are not being effective. They're there, they have a facility, they have a name, they may even have a pastor, and they have a congregation, but they're not impacting a community. They're not making a difference. And you say, why? Why? It's because they're not praying, at least in part. They're not praying. They're not communing with this almighty, all-powerful God that wants to do exceedingly and abundantly beyond all that they could ever ask or think. That's what God expects. So prayer is a sacred duty. Prayer is certainly a constant need, but Luke 18, 
verse 1, I want to third, share with you the third word. Notice again the passage. He spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. I want you to focus on that word faint. Faint. Prayer is a practical necessity. You see, we're to pray so that we don't faint. Now, when we talk about fainting, we're not talking about physical fainting. That's, that's, not, that's not what the passage implies. It's not physical fainting. I, I've seen people faint physically. For many years, I served as a senior pastor, and I recall one wedding I was doing, and there were you know, a number of groomsmen, a number of bridesmaids, and the bride and groom, and we're all on the platform, and all of a sudden, boom, one of those, those groomsmen, he went down. I mean, he just literally fainted. He did not bounce back up. He did not come to. There he was, just kind of half on the platform and half on the steps. He fainted. He was done. So what do you do? So I had two groomsmen. One grabbed his arms, one grabbed his legs, and they kind of carried him out. We went on, with the, I went on the, with the wedding. He fainted. He was sick. No one knew that he was sick. Uh, he probably knew, but he fainted. Now, that's physical fainting, but that's not, the, that's not the concept here at all. You say, well, then what does it mean? It means to lose heart. It means to grow weary. It, it means to fall out, to give up, to, to, to be spiritless, if you will. And, and that drive and that, that passion and that determination uh, is, is gone. It's been depleted. And, and they just get to a, a point of, of, of weariness. And, and so what God is saying is prayer is the antidote, the antidote uh, for that condition. I have a, a practice that when my grandchildren turn 10 years of age, I take them on a trip with me, just the two of us, for a week. And uh, we always wrap it around somewhere where I'm going to speak and it may be a, you know, a revival meeting or a, a conference of some sort or maybe just a Sunday. And then we do a bunch of fun stuff and we just travel and we fly to wherever it is and we just have a good time. And it gives me that bonding time. Well, I have one granddaughter and her name is Michaela. And uh, wow, she is the Energizer Bunny, especially when she was 10 years of age. And wow, she wore me out. And um, I discovered she was the antidote uh, she was the antidote for a sleepless night, for insomnia. I mean, just spending a week with her, I would hit that bed and boom, I was done. Well, the antidote for discouragement, for um, uh, weariness, the, the antidote for uh, just wanting to give up. And there are times we get there is prayer. You go to God in prayer, and that is a, a refreshing discipline, a refreshing uh, exp exercise in our Christian living. Uh, life can be tough at times. We know that. Disappointments come, difficulties come, trials, temptations. Job said it well. Not, a, not an encouraging verse, but a, a reality verse. Job 14.1, man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. I often think of the psalmist in Psalm 34, 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, not the unrighteous. You know, if we, were, if we were making all the decisions and writing the Bible, we probably would say many are the afflictions of, of the unrighteous, people who don't know God. But God said, no, many are the afflictions of, of the righteous. The fact is, it's not if we fall into diverse temptations, it's when we fall into diverse temptations. The reality is we get to that point in life. Life can be tough. But let me help you. Church life can be tough sometimes. We're busy. We're focused. There are many obligations, many responsibilities. And it's just so easy because Satan kind of beats on us and beats on us and beats on us. And, and many times our mind goes to other people who aren't doing what they should do. And, and we begin to just kind of get, get fuzzy in our, in our thinking. And uh, you know what we need to do? We need to pray. We just need to get alone with God. He is still on the throne. Our God is the one that we need to focus on. He hears our prayers. He answers our prayers. He meets our needs. Oh my goodness, prayer is the antidote for giving up, for being discouraged, for throwing in the towel. I like what someone said years ago. Pray when you feel like it. Pray when you don't feel like it. Pray in order to feel like it. There are times in my life when I pray because I feel like it. I want you to know, even being in ministry for, you know, 47 years, there's time I, I don't feel like it. I'm tired. I'm burdened. I'm frustrated. But you pray even when you don't feel like it. And then guess what happens? A few minutes into the prayer, you feel like it. Pray in order to feel like it. Why? Because it's a sacred duty. It's, what, it, it, it's something we ought to do. Why? Because it's a constant need. Any day, every day, any time, any place, any condition. And prayer is a practical necessity 
I am not a singer, but I will share the words of this song uh, to you. Most of you will know it and be familiar with it, but I think it just kind of captures everything I've been saying. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer that calls me from a world of care and bids me at my Father's thrones, makes all my wants and wishes known. In seasons of distress and grief, my soul has often found relief and oft escaped the tempter's snare by thy return, sweet hour of prayer. So can I challenge you tonight? Pray, pray. We're called to pray. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man brings forth much. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for giving us a few minutes tonight to open your word, to explore a verse, and to consider these, these reasons why prayer is so essential and so important. I thank you, God, for the example of your Son. I thank you for the encouragement of the Holy Spirit. I thank you for the expectation, God, that you have that, that we would call unto you and the promise that you would answer. So, Lord, I pray tonight, invigorate our prayer lives. Help us to pray as we ought. Help us, Lord, to pray always, and help us, God, to pray so that we don't give up. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.